You're tuned in to the soothing sounds and gentle rhythms of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Welcome back to another exciting episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. We're a vintage fiction discussion show focused on paperbacks and authors from the 20th century in the action adventure, crime, spy, and western genres. We have an impossibly popular blog at paperbackwarrior.com where we post daily reviews of old books we read. I'm your co-host Eric, and it's time to throw it over to Tom to preview today's episode. Thank you, Eric. On today's show... I'll be presenting a feature on the life and work of a pioneer of paperback original novels named Richard Himmel. I'll also be reviewing the second book in Himmel's Johnny Maguire series titled The Chinese Keyhole. What's your review today, Eric? I'll be reviewing 1960s The Man Trackers by William Mulvihill. Good. All right. Before we launch into our feature, I have a question for you, Eric. Both of us are first and foremost readers. But we're also book collectors with sizable libraries of used paperbacks. But neither of us are book dealers. So my question for you is, have you ever bought a valuable book cheaply and flipped it to make money? (laughs) No, because I'm normally the dumbo buying the book at some outrageous price. And when I get home, I I find the sticker somewhere that says it was a buck 25 or something, and, and I'll pay like 30 bucks. That's funny. Now, I'm really not interested in in being a book dealer at all, but I'm also not above making a quick buck. So I got a particular story that comes to mind. A while ago, I was in Asheville, North Carolina, on vacation with my wife, celebrating our 20th wedding anniversary. Have you ever been to Asheville? I have. I've been there a few times. It wasn't too far from my uh, hometown in Roanoke, Virginia. Okay, cool. Asheville's this really nice town in the far western side of North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's kind of a hippie town. There's like bohemians who do like drum circles every night in the town square. You get the idea. It's also a town known for its beer. There's a microbrewery every 10 feet with fancy local beers on tap. Now, I'm not a drinker, but my wife likes a good microbrew. So every night we went and found a microbrewery, uh, different microbreweries that had trivia night. And we'd sit down. Now, I'm a walking Wikipedia at Trivia Night, and so we would inevitably win the Trivia Night, and the prize would usually be like a 20 or $50 gift certificate for that bar that we'd never go to again, so my wife got to drink for free at these cool little bars. Anyway, we explored a lot of the nearby town and did some waterfall hikes, and as we're driving around, I'm always checking Yelp and Google Maps looking for used bookstores. And when I found one, we'd stop by, and I'd buy, go to the vintage paperback st- buy a bunch of vintage paperback while the wife's walking around uh, the quaint little downtowns. In the process, I found some really great used bookstores up there and had some really nice conversations with local booksellers. Anyway, back in Asheville, we went to a used bookstore called Downtown Books and News. We went in, and there wasn't a lot for me there, but I did see a spinner rack there with an old 1972 sleazy paperback called The Mexican Connection by Howard Winslow. I'm going to hand this to you right now. Reach over. It's a photograph of that book. Describe what you're seeing. Uh, Nipples. (laughs) The Mexican Connection, A Central Mania of Violence and Drugs by Howard Winslow. It's a it's a chick with some glasses on. It looks like a hippie chick. Okay, so and the so the cover has this uh, photo of a rather unattractive woman, uh, um, and someone has actually written one dollar on the cover in black magic marker. And as you said, the tagline of the book is "A Sensual Mania of Violence and Drugs," and the back cover indicates that it's a crime story about smuggling heroin into the U.S. I'd never heard of this book. I'd never heard of the Sleaze Publisher. I had never heard of Howard Winslow but I am a cheap date, and it doesn't take much to make me buy a book. So I take it up to the counter. The guy at the counter has no idea how to price this book. And the spinner rack served basically as the bargain bin for the shop. And so I said to the clerk, I said, some nitwit wrote $1 on the cover in black magic marker. I'm probably overpaying, but I'm willing to give you $1 for this book. Yeah, but you got to eat the tax, man. And he agreed. So I handed him a single, a $1 bill. I shoved the book into my back pocket of my jeans, and I left the store. So about a half hour later, we're walk- my wife and I are walking around Asheville's quaint little downtown, basically being tourists, and we find some knick-knack store that the wife wanted to go into. I remember there was a bench or a chair sitting outside for the husbands to wait. 
and I was happy to sit for a few minutes. And while I'm sitting there, um, the I Google uh, the Mexican Connection by Howard Winslow, and it turns out the paperback is an insanely rare lost Harry Whittington novel that had an incredibly small print run and was never reprinted again. Now, for listeners unfamiliar with the author, Harry Whittington authored authored over 170 books, and he's considered the king of paperbacks. He's often great, and we have loads and loads of reviews of his books on our blog, paperbackwarrior.com. Now, during the late 1960s and early 1970s, Harry Whittington fell on hard times, and he made deals with porno book publishers to print his erotic novels, and he got paid like $1,000 a book. It wasn't part of his life that made him very proud, but, you know, it's part of his bibliography. Anyway, so Harry Whittington is an author who can, is considered to be very collectible by people who, like, put their books in plastic and then refuse to ever read them or open them. And these lost sleaze novels are the holy grail for collectors when they, it turns out they were written by Harry Whittington. And I had just bought one, this remarkably rare book, for $1. So you know what I did, Eric? I'm very proud of this. What would you do? I read it. I, ah. I read it on that vacation. It stayed in my back pocket as we drove through the mountains. When I had a few minutes here and there, I read a few pages. We had a really lovely Airbnb up in the mountains with a hot tub jacuzzi on the deck, and I read the book in the hot tub, and I finished it. You know what? It was the best Harry Winnington novel you've ever read. <laughs> no, it pretty much sucked. It, it was a very basic drug smuggling story. Uh, they were putting dope inside like a hollow bull artifact and smuggling across the border. But a plot device that had been used dozens of times better elsewhere. The DEA was a big part of it, and everyone was having sex with each other in graphic detail. When I finished the book, I basically threw it into my suitcase, brought it home to Florida, and I put it up on eBay for 100 bucks. It sold in like five minutes. Wow. I felt like an idiot because it was clearly underpriced at $100. So in preparation for today's show, I Google The Mexican Connection by Howard Winslow, and I see my old, my old copy of the book on an auction site called WorthPoint. Now, you need to register for WorthPoint to see how much the new owner was asking for it. And candidly, I don't want to know. But it's definitely my copy of the book because the photos have that $1 um, black magic marker asking price on the cover. Uh, I just need to be happy with making 100 times my investment and getting to read the book, <laughs> even if it sucked. You know, it's these type of stories that fuel our desire to enter every little thrift and antique store. I mean, every bookstore. And I tell my wife this all the time. You just never know what you're going to find. It's, uh, you know, that story is really influential and just keeps me digging, you know? Yeah, and, and it, what's fun, especially living in Florida, we have, I feel like we have an, a disproportionate amount of antique and thrift stores here in Florida. Maybe all of America is like that. But it's worth going back every six months or so because you never know when some old man's going to die and his wife's <laughs> going to give the collection to the owner. Right. So you ready for the feature? Let's do it. Music, please. Today we take a peek behind the curtain and present you with the untold story of author Richard Himmel. Richard was born in Chicago in 1920 and pretty much lived there for nearly his whole life. He really loved the written word, and he attended the University of Chicago to study writing under the tutelage of his mentor, a writer named Thornton Wilder, who uh, was the author behind the play Our Town. I interviewed John Himmel, his son, in preparation for today's podcast and for a piece I wrote, a feature on, uh, on his dad. And he said that his dad intended to become an English teacher. He was a voracious reader. In his library, he had first editions, including D.H. Uh, Lawrence collection, and he was always drawn toward the literary arts, his son told me. Now, Richard's plan to teach writing was sidelined by World War II. When the time came to serve, he enlisted in the U.S. Army. However, some illness prevented him from being shipped overseas into the fields of combat. And his son explained that the Army realized early on that Richard was a pretty smart boy, and he was assigned to General Patton's staff. He wrote pamphlets and brochures for all sorts of things, such as identifying Japanese aircraft, as well as a primer on the Japanese language. Now, after the war, Richard Himmel returned to Chicago with the intention of becoming an English teacher. Now, waiting, while waiting for this to occur, he took a job at his sister's houseware store in the northern suburb of Winnetka, where I happen to live between the years 1970 and 1981. Uh, he began taking on decorating jobs, and his career as an interior decorator was basically made. 
Now, Richard's knack for colors and spacing eventually made him one of the most sought-after interior designers in all the United States. And he had these high-profile clients, including boxer Muhammad Ali and Hugh Hefner's Playboy Club. But as his business is growing and becoming established, he never, lo- he never lost his love of the written word. So around 1950, a new outfit called Fawcett Gold Medal had plans to revolutionize the publishing industry by releasing all new, all original novels directly to the paperback format with salacious painted covers. Now, for the past decade, paperbacks had just been reprints of successful hardcover literary works. And the idea of releasing original material in a 25-cent paperback, it filled this important hole in the book market for readers after the pulp magazines had disappeared. Paperback originals were poised to be the next big thing, and publishing houses like Fawcett Gold Medal needed talented authors who could write compelling prose very quickly. Now, at the time, Richard and all of America had become infatuated with the prose of Mickey Spillane. And and Richard writes a book called I'll Find You about a hard-boiled Chicago lawyer named Johnny McGuire who functions as a private eye for his clients. Now, Richard submits the manuscript to Fawcett Gold Medal, who releases the book in 1950 as Fawcett Gold Medal's fifth paperback original novel. Now, the book was an instant success and saw five printings through 1955 and a second life in 1962 when it was released under the title It's Murder, McGuire. So at this point, Richard gets a literary agent in New York named Sterling Lord, and they work together to get more books by Richard published. This put, this put Richard in good company because Sterling Lord represented some of the big names in 20th century literature, including Jack Kerouac, Ken Kesey, who wrote uh, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, and Howard Fast. The second installment of the Johnny Maguire series was called The Chinese Keyhole from 1951. And I'm going to review that novel at the end of the episode, but let me say this. It's a really odd sequel because there's no mention of Chicago whatsoever in the book, whereas the first novel was really steeped in the Windy City's sights and flavors. Another major change is that the Chinese keyhole is a spy novel, not a hard-boiled crime story. There's a hasty explanation at the beginning of the book that attorney Johnny McGuire was also an occasional spy for a shadowy U.S. intelligence agency. The paperback's great, but it, it was just a weird and abrupt genre shift. My theory is that it was a standalone novel at some point. Um, it was a spy thriller that he wrote, and then his literary agent or publisher told him to edit the book to make it Johnny Maguire number two. Now, Mickey Spillane taught the publishing world that there is big money to be made in series characters, and Himmel apparently was happy to oblige. So later in 1951, Fawcett Gold Medal released the third Johnny Maguire novel, I Have Gloria Kirby, and things went gangbusters. Over one million copies were sold, which firmly established Richard Himmel to be one of the best-selling authors in the Fawcett Gold Medal stable. It was also a big year for Himmel and his wife for another reason, the arrival of their son, this guy John uh, Himmel that I interviewed. Now, they chose a familiar name for him. His name is John McGuire Himmel. His son was the second Johnny McGuire. He basically (laughs) named his son after his series character. That's awesome. Yeah. So throughout the 1950s, Richard was working during the day as an interior designer and at night as a successful writer, pecking away at his typewriter with two fingers and a cigarette hanging from his mouth. His son said, growing up, I still remember that sound. I still have his typewriter. After the success of the, well, the Johnny McGuire series opened the door for Richard to get romantic and sexy mainstream novels published as well. The best of these books uh, would be The Sharp Edge and Beyond Desire, which were also published by Fawcett Gold Medal, while others found homes in multiple printings elsewhere. The Johnny Maguire series continued for five total installments through 1958's The Rich and the Damned. This was followed by a 19-year hiatus from writing and publishing. There was a period in his life where Richard Himmel was not writing at all because his career as a designer really took off, his son told me. He really didn't have much time to write, but it was always in his mind. And eventually he went at it. He went back at it. He returned to publishing with three longer standalone thrillers between 1977 and 1981, each with page counts exceeding 300 pages. The novels were successful and moved the action to international settings, including Iraq, Cuba, and China. By this time, Richard was a high-profile member of Chicago's high society, 
and each subsequent paperback was greeted with increasing fanfare. His son John recalls the release party for his dad's 1979 Cuba thriller, Lions at Night. Richard Himmel used a parking lot on a busy street corner in Chicago's famed Magnificent Mile for this extravagant outdoor gala. He rented actual lions and guys dressed in gorilla fatigues for this big-ass party, and he sold a lot of books there, John said. He uh, pointed out that his father was quite a showman. Richard's final manuscript was a novel about with the working title of, dig this, Eric, <laughs> The Uncircumcised Jew. <laughs> but but his, his literary agent was unable to sell it, oddly enough. The book was submitted to publishers in, uh, in the 1990s, and it just didn't sell. So his Richard's literary winning streak had basically ended, and he probably got a little discouraged there. He was aging at that point and dealing with health issues, and his career as a novelist basically ended. But he never retired from the decorating business. According to John, his father was sick for a long time at the end of his life. He was a heavy smoker and obviously a workaholic. He didn't get much exercise, and uh, heart problems ended up leading to his death in 2000 in Florida. Today, Richard is mostly remembered as a visionary in the field of interior design. Now, his son, John, that I spoke to, uh, took over the business and continues in the field of design, keeping the Himmel name alive as this go-to brand for upscale decorating clients. The Johnny McGuire series is one of the most successful side jobs in the paperback original era, and it was really almost lost to the ages until Lee Goldberg's Cutting Edge Press started reprinting the books in 2019 as trade paperbacks and affordable ebooks. John, his son, is just thrilled that his father's literary work has found this new audience in this new century. Uh, he said, There was very little that my dad put his mind to that he didn't excel. My dad was a generic genius. So uh, that was my uh, article and interview with uh, John Himmel. I want to thank uh, Paperback Confidential, uh, the book by Brian Ritt, for some information. And uh, you got a review to do. Yeah, and I'll just say after the end of that, uh, you know, over the course of doing Paperback Warrior, I think one of my favorite aspects is the investigative stuff that we do with finding these authors' families and being able to spotlight their father or grandfather or husband's work. And we've done it countless times over the last few years, and I hope that we can continue to do that. And uh, speaking of which, before I forget, Tom, uh, do you remember a World War II adventure novel we covered last summer called uh, Pieces of the Game? Yeah, definitely, by Lee Gifford, right? Yeah, exactly. We, we reviewed the book on paperbackwarrior.com, and I think we even talked about it on the show. It was originally published by Fawcett Gold Medal in 1960 under a relatively unknown name of Lee Gifford. Now, you and I researched and couldn't come up with anything else written by this author, and at one point we had thought it was written by uh, Lou Cameron. Yeah, that was our big theory, is that we had found this lost <laughs> Lou Cameron right. book, and you loved it. You, you thought the, you, were, you were gaga over this book. You said it was so good. Yeah, definitely, and uh, finally, after all this time, we were able to get an answer. Thanks to Lee Goldberg and his imprint, Cutting Edge Books, Pieces of the Game has been reprinted at an affordable price. Plus, Goldberg was able to verify that Lee Gifford was the real author. Through his family members, Goldberg learned that the book was the only novel Gifford wrote. So mystery solved, and thankfully due to our review last year, the book has now been reintroduced to modern audiences with this uh, brand new reprint. Uh, That's so th awesome, yeah. Cutting Edge Books has been putting out so much good stuff lately. I yeah, mean, it's hard to keep up. Yeah, he's, I don't know where Lee Goldberg finds the time to write bestsellers when he continues just to find these books. I mean, of course, we're his research and development department. Yeah. He seems to, when, when we read and like a book, he seems to acquire the rights or... And then uh, next thing you know, it's a cutting-edge book. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. Hopefully we'll be flying around first class. Yeah. <laughs> this is a fat chance. Uh, I'm reviewing an African adventure novel called The Man Trackers, written by William Mulvihill. Uh, Mulvihill is spelled M-U-L-V-I-H-I-L-L -L, and published in 1960. It was later reprinted as Serengeti in 1995. Backstory on the author, uh, Mulvihill was a squad leader during World War II's Battle of the Bulge. After the war, he taught high school for 32 years on Long Island in New York. He was a scholar on Africa and became an expert on Africa's natural history. He utilized this passion to fuel the Man Trackers, which later would be retitled Serengeti for the 1995 reprint. Readers are introduced to Captain Pfeiffer in 1910 as he's serving in the German Imperial Army in Africa. He's a hot-headed, fierce fighting man with a career goal of becoming a legendary general. But on this day, things take a drastic turn for Pfeiffer. While hunting, a leopard takes him by surprise, severely mauling and disfiguring him before he can be rescued by his fellow soldiers. 
Hanging on for life and death, uh, Pfeiffer is taken to a hospital for a long rehabilitative stint. Once uh, Pfeiffer heals, the German military discharges him from service due to his appalling appearance. That's mighty vain of them. Uh, Pfeiffer, with fu- Pfeiffer is furious with himself, the military, and Africa, and he returns to the bush as a solo hunter, determined to kill every single animal on the continent. That's his only reason to rise and exist each day, to slaughter every animal he can find. So Pfeiffer's killing spree through the African countryside is spread by word of mouth to a man named John Thrustwood. He's an aging former hunter that was at one time one of the best hunters on the continent. He was also a trader, a farmer, and a mercenary for the British Army. He's worn a lot of hats, and after learning about Pfeiffer's insane quest to mass slaughter all the animals, he teams up with his old friend and servant, Chapupa, to head back into the brush one more time to hunt down Pfeiffer. Now, I'm not ruining anything for readers when I say that Thrustwood finds and captures Pfeiffer. In fact, he he gives them over to African officials. But Pfeiffer escapes and resumes his bloody tirade, and that's the bulk of the narrative. Thrustwood and Chapupa realizing that they must hunt and actually kill Pfeiffer to end his campaign. Mulvihill's love of history and African landscapes was really a delight to read, but his delivery is of one purpose, simply the storyline. The book has a distinct absence of humor, there's no witty dialogue, and there's no real focus on character development. Mulvihill is very serious with his presentation. He's almost scholarly in the telling of the tale. It was an adjustment for me, but a fourth of the way in, I found that I not only accepted it, but I really, really enjoyed it. This is a fantastic adventure story that builds to a fiery crescendo. Pfeiffer versus Thrustwood and Chapupa is the main event, and Mulvihill pulls no punches. I really love the book, and Tom, every time I go into a used bookstore, I search for books by this author. I've only found one other novel, and I think it's called The Sands of Kilimanjaro, which was made into a film, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but again, this book is The Man Trackers by William Mulvihill. Now, I've never heard of the guy. You're really drawn to these big game hunter books for some reason. Yeah, and I was going to make a, a plea out to listeners to, uh, to encourage me to read more of these books. If you have any recommendations, let me know. The only one that I know of other than this was... Um, I think I've got like The Great Hunt or something, which is an African uh, hunting book. And I just finished one, uh, and the name escapes me now, but it's out of paperwackwarrior.com. But I'd like to read more. I just don't know where to start. Yeah. If someone wants to make a quick buck, they can write a big game hunter book, <laughs> and they'll know that you will buy it for yes. sure. They'll make it at least one sale. <laughs> no doubt about it. All right. So shifting gears, I want to go back to Richard Himmel and review The Chinese Keyhole, which was the second book in the Johnny Maguire series. So in the 1950s, Richard Himmel wrote five books in this Johnny Maguire series, which is really about a lawyer who functions as a hard-boiled detective and all-around troubleshooter. Now, I love the series' debut, and uh, so I was excited to tackle the second installment called The Chinese Keyhole. It was written and published at least in 1951. The book was originally a Fawcett gold medal paperback and has been reprinted by Cutting Edge Books. The novel opens with Johnny telling the reader something he had neglected to share in the first book. During World War II, Johnny was recruited into the OSS, the wartime precursor to the CIA. And he explains that he's periodically called upon to set aside his law practice to engage in espionage at the request of the U.S. State Department. Yes, our favorite hard-boiled Chicago lawyer is evidently a spy as well. It's almost like the author had a cool idea for a spy novel and decided to slot Johnny Maguire into it as the lead role in the lead role because he had an extra protagonist lying around with no immediate plans. Anyway, Johnny's handler instructs him to go to the Chinese Keyhole, a strip club in Chinatown, presumably in Chicago. And his job is to deliver a coded message to an Asian stripper. Sounds like a very tough assignment. Uh, One thing leads to another, and Johnny has a bloodbath on his hands. The only way to get close to the killers is to, well, sleep with a stripper. A part-time spy, uh, his work is never done, I guess. (laughs) Meanwhile, Johnny's childhood friend Tom was recently shot in the back six times uh, and with no leads as to the killer's identity. So Tom is this walking saint on Earth, and who would want to kill a guy like that? Now, if you're familiar with the way 1950s plotting worked, you've probably already guessed that Tom's death is somehow tied into the nudie bar spy situation. A central mystery develops involving the identity of the enemy spy ring boss, and the solution, a big reveal at the end, was pretty obvious to anyone paying attention. 
That said, the series of final confrontations between Johnny and his adversaries was pretty outstanding. Now, Richard Himmel was a great writer who really knew how to keep a story moving. And the Chinese keyhole is just a really sexy and exciting and thin paperback. You can read this thing in just a couple days. Now, readers should know that this 1951 book of disposable fiction has some very retrograde things to say about Asians and gay people. Now, it didn't bother me, but just consider yourself warned because, you know, 1951 was, in fact, nearly 70 years ago and his attitudes were different. So Richard Himmel is one of these guys who, in my mind, just really deserves to be remembered. And the Chinese keyhole was romantic and exciting, and uh, it was just domestic spy fiction at its best. And I'm just thrilled that Cutting Edge Books has made this series available uh, to a new generation. And, and I'm just excited to see what Johnny McGuire is going to do next. And I intend to read all those books and review them at paperbackwarrior.com. Uh, this concludes today's episode of the Paperback Warrior podcast. Check out the blog for daily reviews of vintage fiction. And follow us on Facebook to see covers of all these books and join the conversation. And we're going to talk to you again next week. Bye, everybody.